working uh, for a while in optimizing uh, our large uh, summarized experiment uh, data sets for bulk RNA-seq, uh, especially for some of the very uh, large features, uh, feature data that we have, the junctions um, are a problem sometimes to handle. And uh, so this is about uh, some methods that I realized in the last year or so that actually we, have, we weren't using and uh, it might, might, might make our life easier uh, dealing with large RSCs. <clears throat> so yeah, I put some exploration code in the GitHub link there, um, but pretty much the code is gonna be also on, the, uh, on these slides today, which are shared on the spreadsheet. So um, you could uh, copy the and paste the, the code. Just, yeah, so just to is, uh, remind everyone about the summarized experiment data structure, uh, which is a complex uh, class that is like uh, the center of our, our many, our um, bioinformatics data is since uh, most of these data are, are, are structured around uh, what we call the measurement matrix or count matrix. Um, uh, which is the like the large array in the middle where the columns are the samples, experimental experiments perform uh, for each tissue samples or uh, could be cells for single cell RNA. Um, and the features are genomic features on the rows. The rows are uh, the row names in this case. Rows are uh, related to the features, uh, genomic features. <clears throat> And associated with that, uh, packed into this uh, uh, data structure, um, we have this, uh, what we call column data, which is metadata related to the samples. Um, and also um, the feature data, which is, uh, you know, usually it's for range, some right experiment is raw ranges actually, because it include, includes the uh, start and coordinate low chromosome location of each feature. As, uh, the base class summarized experiment doesn't require this information. Features could be of any other type, I suppose. So you don't have to, just a label would suffice sometimes. They only have raw data, not raw ranges. Uh, the other interesting uh, feature of this uh, data structure is that it can have multiple um, matrices. So the actual data values, the measurements, uh, could be essentially overlaid uh, into the same summarized experiment object, but they have to have the same dim dimensions uh, and the same, of course, the columns and the rows are shared between all these matrices. Uh, there are some uh, newer, I think, uh, data structures and classes in uh, bioconductor these days trying to accommodate even different uh, dimensions arrays with different dimensions, matrices with different dimensions inside the objects. I think it's multi-experiment, multi-SA or something like that. So it's interesting. There's a lot to pack into a data structure like this. The main issue is that, uh, that we're having is that, well, for bulk RNA-seq, for example, we use, uh, we do these uh, measurements, we count this, you have these read counts at various levels in terms of genomic features is genes, transcripts, exons, and exon, exon junctions. And while genes, transcripts, and exons are uh, kind of fixed by annotations, we're using a specific annotation. And this here is from this slide, we see the gen code 25 numbers that we have. Um, for, for exon, exon junctions, we have an explosion of uh, features because we're also, it's the only level genomic feature level that we're looking for potentially novel uh, features that are not in the annotation. Uh, the annotation would have only a low number of uh, 350, a relatively low um, in gen code 25, but uh, because we do count whatever the aligner suggests that could be a novel junction there, even though we have some filters when we build this uh, matrices uh, to look for 
you know, we don't store uh, all these junctions if they are only found in one sample. So trying to eliminate some spurious, uh, potentially spurious uh, junctions still could be also systematic, uh, maybe uh, errors or something in the aligner that could still uh, uh, suggest um, junctions that we cannot really ignore if they are found in multiple samples. So surprisingly enough, I mean, maybe not surprisingly, considering though, if the state of the you know, alignment programs today and uh, how difficult it is to align this uh, across introns, um, we have uh, an explosion of this uh, exon exon junctions in our data. I mean, each, each data set of we, which in our case, we have like hundreds of uh, samples in a data set. Um, I noticed that most of the data sets of this size, they have accumulate about over 1 million junctions. So when you merge these together, in, uh, you keep adding potentially novel junctions that are only reported in a data set. So they add up. And for this number of 5,800 uh, almost bulk RNA-seq uh, samples, we accumulated about over five, almost 5.5 5 million junctions. But of course, this is not, uh, this is just something that I was looking at bulk RNA uh, seq data, but this problem actually has been already dealt with partially in some in single cell data, because we have also um, large collect collections of uh, samples out there. And uh, even though they use a uh, low number of features, which is generally genes, the number of cells or samples can be very large. So like a 10, 10 x brain data has uh, 1.3 million samples. So in that case, the column, the number of columns in the RIC uh, data is very large. While in our uh, RNA, bulk RNA seq data you know, junctions, uh, we, uh, the number of rows is the problem, the features. Of course, uh, as, as some of you know, DNA methylation are even, uh, a uh, bigger issue in terms of also number of rows of features which are loci on the um, on the genome and that can be also very large um, close to the size of the genome since yeah, these are all loci in the genome so yeah the, the same a similar problem with that we have to deal with large matrices extremely large uh, measurement uh, matrices and they cannot be practically held in memory on regular computers for analysis. I mean, you need to multi terabyte servers for some of the data, like the DNA methylation data. So, obviously, there are some ways to deal with that and uh, they have to be found. And one of them, the first one is in memory compression. If you can process the data, uh, this matrix as a whole, but in a way that you can compress, uh, represent it in a compressed uh, format directly, the whole matrix in memory. And uh, there are these uh, DGC matrix and RLA, RA, run length encoded array, uh, which is a special case because processing on that is not as fast in the, as on the DGC matrix sparse arrays. Um, and, but even with that, sometimes in memory compression it cannot help, uh, especially with very uh, large data like DNA methylation. So we do have to, uh, there's no other way but to use a storage back matrix representation, which means the whole matrix is obviously stored on, on, on disk or, on, or you know, on any store or storage. Um, and only, you only load blocks at a time in memory to process them uh, incrementally or in, well, in parallelism cannot be very high, obviously, because it defeats the purpose, but still, um, yeah, it only depends on the size of the blocks. Of course, you can do some parallel processing, but uh, the idea is that you limit, yeah, only a part of the array, these large arrays are loaded in, in memory at a time. And the, uh, right now, the consistent solution that, that's out there and fully implemented is HDF5 arrays. Uh, and HDF5 uh, file backed. Uh, hopefully new uh, system, new file support will be added. Uh, I'm still hoping to see that more support for columnar uh, 
data formats like uh, maybe Parquet or some some sort of other file backend because HDF5 has has some limitations uh, in terms of like saving the data takes a long time. There's not much parallel processing going on. So I'm still hoping that things are gonna improve uh, and more, more solution for file back storage will be available. Um, yeah, I have to credit here uh, and have, I'm very grateful for the work of uh, Hervé Paget and uh, Aaron Lan. They have, uh, you know, without, them this wouldn't be possible. They have you know, core classes developed here and supported and added uh, support for compressed matrix or uh, off memory matrix data. Uh, matrix storage uh, it is only possible to people like them. Um, and yeah, the simple code, yeah, I have uh, in the, in the um, GitHub, um, Code you can actually download these uh, junction files if you want to follow along, but or you can uh, to test at some point. But uh, basically, yeah, that you can just sh I can show here the output how it worked without actually running the code myself right now. Um, so uh, yeah, I have this uh, in the code that I provided. I have these utility functions called uh, OI and. OS, which OI is object information, uh, and the OS is object size. Uh, I'm checking the memory size. We're using the lobster, lobster package. I think lobster is funny. Uh, has a funny name. That uh, um, lobster package to. I think you can also use prior. I think or some other packages to check the actual uh, object size of uh, of uh, R objects in memory. Uh, because the default function that you know, tells, I think, the object size uh, method doesn't really account for complex structures. Um, so I had to use, uh, we had to look for other ways to get the actual object uh, size in memory. <clears throat> so as we load a junction file, which is a relatively small one, we only 464 uh, samples. Um, so it takes uh, about, about four, 0.9 gigabytes, which of which 4.7 is actually the say uh, matrix itself. So most of it is the matrix, right? 4.7 gigabytes. Um, and of course, the first thing to note, especially for count data uh, before normalization and everything, but uh, yeah, is that uh, the the read counts are just raw counts. A lot of the values are zero, so it seems. They are a highly sparse matrix, the junction data. And the matrix package provides uh, these uh, classes that can be used to represent a uh, sparse matrix in a compressed format in memory and still maintaining some fast uh, processing capabilities. <clears throat> and a simple conversion is just you know, using the as uh, like casting um, operator here, uh, function method to and you can use sparse matrix or directly the DGC matrix uh, class name um, to, and you see the, to, to convert into a compressed in memory format. And you see the reduction is quite significant from 4.7 to 1.7 gigabytes. And uh, yeah, they, you can, if they even did try to show that the string representation uh, in the sparse, uh, they use dots, wherever the zero is, like there's nothing there, because the way it works internally is by um, this DGC uh, matrix data structure is only keeps track of essential of, uh, of non-zero values in an interesting way. There are, it's, uh, yeah, it's, you can look into the details here for uh, and other, many other places to understand the data structure and the way it's encoded. Um, and uh, it's it's quite interesting because it allows actually this way of encoding uh, and compressing. Uh, it allows some operations to be even faster than uh, on the on the regular uh, unpacked, you know, regular representation of the matrix in memory. Like row sums and call sums could be uh, faster since you only go over the very fast access to only the non-zero value. Of course, all these in, uh, op optimizations, and memory saving and even sp speed computation saving uh, 
are only possible if you have high sparseness, high sparsity. Um, which uh, you know, in the case of junction data, yes, this is true. But uh, in many other cases, this is not a this is not a generic solution, right? You cannot apply it to. Uh, I think there was some. Um, if you log transform the data or you do anything with it, uh, uh, you'll lose the sparse sparseness. So you'll uh, you can see what happens actually in case of uh, if I just add one to all the values in this case. Uh, and I convert it um, to a sparse matrix, you actually get an increase in size because there is no zeros to skip. So you have to store all elements and you have to basically store more data for each element uh, if are, none of them are zero. Uh, yes, yeah, so the total is like 4.7 to almost seven gigabytes. <laughs> which is not a compression at all, uh, of course. So for more generic, we also have the option to use RLE matrix, uh, run length encoding. Uh, it's, it's just a little trick here that works for the, um, if, it, if it's not sparse, but it still has repeated consecutive values, you can use this run length, simple run length encoding compression scheme. Um, that is still, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't cover, uh, random data, of course, it's only it, like the transformation we did before by adding one, you have instead of zero, you have runs of ones now, of one now. Uh, and those are compressed, but you can see the compression is not as good. Um, you get a slightly high, it's larger than, but at least it's consistent for the same, if you have zeros or one is the same compression. Um, but it's not, it's slightly you know, worse than uh, on the DGC matrix if you have sparsity. And uh, when you run out of solutions, of course, when you, the data is really random or processed in such a way that you cannot really, uh, really use any of these uh, tricks, um, you have to rely on off memory. I have to offload the whole uh, storage uh, out of memory and try to process it in chunks at a time. That's the only way. <laughs> so HDF5 matrix seems to be the fully implemented solution currently. And of course, uh, the first, if you actually try to convert it, you'll have the very pleasant surprise to, to see that the memory used by that matrix is zero which is well, a megabyte is rounded. It's actually a few kilobytes there, but because of the rounding, it's rounded down to zero, um, which of course would be like the ideal uh, compression. <laughs> but the data is actually, of course, of loaded to disk. So this whole array is actually stored into disk and only, only the deep dimension, dim names, only the row names and column names are essentially kept uh, in memory in the memory data kilobytes in this case. Um, that's a slow uh, operation because, yeah, it also actually uses even HDF5 uh, format. It's quite uh, uh, complex and it can actually do some, uh, even some compression. It, uh, I think these transformations uh, even check sparsity and can make use of sparsity when it writes uh, data in uh, some sort of uh, compressed format on disk. And uh, the first time you know this, when you run this um, um, conversion, you, you have this, if you just run it like that from a simple matrix, you have this uh, warning that uh, mentioned chunk size and which of course it's uh, something that might not be easy to, to get at this point and to tweak unless you dig into the documentation and see that in order to actually access specific to slice the data, uh, you need to do this, what they call chunking in HDF uh, language, I think, uh, terminology. Uh, so the chunking is like a, I would take it like a form of indexing the, the storage on disk, uh, the indexing the various blocks. So you, when you want to slice it, it as for, for a specific offset in the data and on specific columns or, uh, rows, it knows how to go into the compressed data or the stored data on disk to 
jump directly into that uh, file offset and retrieve the data fast uh, instead of scanning the whole thing or uh, whatever. They, it's kind of hard to index on two dimensions. So that's why you have to use this block or chunk uh, mechanism. Uh, that's also good for, it's definitely used for, for slicing to use a specific chunking with the smaller dimension, which increases the uh, file style, size uh, substantially because you have to add, add uh, for each column and in the uh, row information, I guess you have to add some extra uh, bytes on disk. Uh, now, this is all part of the delayed array framework, uh, which is, uh, Again, I think it's work of uh, Hervé Paget, and uh, it's at least been it's been built in summarized experiment for quite a while, I think. But because of most uh, a lot of work have been, has been done on large data sets on single cell experiment uh, data, um, they actually uh, it seems to me that more progress has been done with in using these derived uh, classes derived from summarized experiment, which is like single cell experiment class, and uh, they use that extensively there, uh, this delayed array framework, which is uh, like a, a wrapper class. So delayed array is like a wrapper class uh, that uh, tries to provide, immediate, like simulates an array by have providing some basic uh, access to some basic array operations, but it, it mediates, uh, it makes the transparent access to to blocks and the way it's uh, the, the, the data is actually stored on disk and has to be retrieved in, in, a, in, a, in a, well, they say lazy processing or delayed processing. So it's gonna be retrieved there. It takes a little while. It's not as when you have it in memory, it's much more, uh, it's faster of course, but these limitations here that it still does all, all the, it supports most of the array operations, but they will be uh, delayed and executed in a, in a different uh, manner than you expect. Now there is, they have uh, interesting terminology there, like a seed and seed contract. They can, uh, I didn't get much into, into this. Uh, there's obviously the only, I think the more main thread here is that yeah, you have to tie uh, this delayed array to a specific backend class in, in a bioconductor, which at this point you have RLE array, HDF5 array, and uh, I guess our, our, our HD5 client. I'm not sure exactly how that works. Might be supporting all taxes, I'm not sure. But um, basically they, uh, these backends uh, provide this uh, block processing mechanism or they can help with fetching the data and to, to and they have to, to, to follow some specifications of the delay array, uh, I guess, interface, we could call it, I guess, uh, methods that they, they require to work in a specific way. So these backend classes are, are um, essential for this. And the, the thing is the backend classes can be still, you know, they're very somewhat flexible. You can always add theoretically a new backend class, like, uh, there are some efforts these days, I think, to try to add other uh, storage formats, like I think TileDB might be one of them. Some interesting uh, file storage uh, besides HDF5 that could be used as a backend, as long as somebody writes the uh, backend class to provide all the interface needed by delayed array to serve the uh, chunks and blocks as expected. And of course, as I mentioned before, uh, in indexing, this cannot be just a flat file or whatever format. It has to be a very well indexed in the two dimensions. Well, the format actually provides, theoretically, even HDF5 and the DLA array, they support multiple dimensions, more than two. Um, but uh, any anyway, we, there's obviously a need for uh, very uh, smart indexing so you can quickly access specific parts of the file and slice um, the matrix. So, and as I said, single cell experiment already had, is ahead of uh, in this area as of the, our current usage of summarized experiment. Uh, we didn't use a lot of uh, compressed data, but apparently now it's common um, 
a common use is to have this compressed in either way, uh, either in memory. In some cases, they use uh, some of the the assay data is in an, uh, sparse format, which is of course another good possibility for single cell data. Uh, but also for even larger data sets, like I mentioned before, like the 10, 10x brain data. Uh, in this example, you can easily run it and see that it's actually HDF5 matrix that's backs it. And it also doesn't take a lot of memory, well, <laughs> zero megabytes around it here, but uh, yeah, it's a lot, it's, everything is offloaded. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the current documentation about uh, you know, the state of the art, uh, single cell processing, um, yeah, there is already, this is already dealt with. I mean, that's why I feel like for summarized experiment for bulk rna -seq, we sometimes even go to cast this, uh, our summarized experiment um, of classes to, to single cell experiment because there's so much progress in that area that can be backported to to think to summarize the experiment, to range summarize the experiment that we're using bulk rna -seq. So yes, uh, just the methods are there. We just, at least in our, in our in, we didn't use them much in our, uh, I didn't see them in our scripts, but maybe it's time to, yeah, to try to adopt them. Um, so you can always convert and save quite a bit, uh, especially for junction counts and save back the RSE junction file as a much smaller, uh, not, not the file is actually not smaller, which is uh, funny. Um, but uh, but the in memory uh, footprint is 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 actually is much better as you as you saw before. So interestingly enough, yeah, the R data file size uh, is slightly larger for this example here. Uh, but that's because of GZ compression, which is applied to R data, which doesn't help at all with uh, fast memory access. But it's very good for compression and it seems to. Of course, uh, because of the sparseness, uh, sparsity of the the counts data, it does GZ does a very good thing, very good uh, job, but it it doesn't work the same you know, the way the compression scheme on the on the especially encoded um, sparse uh, compressed um, sparse matrices in DGC matrix format. Now. Uh, yeah, that's, we should also make use of this uh, kind of, uh, they come awkwardly names, uh, well, there's probably no other way, methods uh, that uh, can be used like uh, for plain RSC uh, data. And I've been using this recently uh, quite a bit. It's, you have this, just have all these mouthful names, <laughs> save HDF5 uh, summarized experiment, load HDF5 summarized experiment, and you can add an HDF5 array package, uh, but they work with just uh, summarized experiment and derivat derivat derivatives, and uh, you have to specify directory because it places those files, like I think two files, one is the assay file, which is an H5 file, and the other one is just a, an R data file, which is just a, a call data and, row ranges data. Um, the other problem with, as I mentioned before, with HDF, and not problem, but maybe a limitation of the way it works is that it, it takes a, quite a long bit of time to save these files, because it does a lot of things, compression and prepares, you know, indexing of the blocks and stuff. Um, and, uh, and actually, you have to use these functions instead of the way I, I compress the, uh, the matrix earlier with just a plain uh, cast to this um, to this class, uh, to HDF5 matrix class, um, because this takes care of indexing and chunking uh, appropriately. So you can slice uh, specific samples or, uh, or even uh, features, right? Genes or uh, junctions um, much faster than if you just say the HDF5, uh, matrix directly. So you have to use these wrapper functions that package everything nicely for you, the call data and row ranges data in, uh, and the matrix and the connection between them is well made with all the chunk indexing that you need for slicing later. Um, 
So yeah, there are obviously advantages to this, obviously. The, if, if you save one of these, our merged files, uh, like you have this, uh, like 5,700 uh, samples, uh, whatever, even for genes, for uh, uh, exons, or especially for junctions, if you really want to load them and to see, I mean, maybe get some global stats, it's very fast to load this uh, HDF5-backed uh, files because only the metadata is loaded when you actually run the load command. Uh, and everything else is uh, delayed, right? Uh, you, only when you need to process the actual values or access the values in the matrix, only then it reads whatever uh, subsetting you provide for, the, for that matrix. Um, and you know, it's, it is, of course it is, that's the beauty of the delayed array uh, framework. It really behaves like a real array and you can do this slicing of the whole RSC um, and create a, just a new RSC in memory again, file back is gonna be, everything is gonna be filed back when you do this subsetting, but you see the subsetting in the metadata, which is great, you know, if you want to get quick summaries related to metadata only. And when you get to process them or you want to realize or actualize, how they call it, realize, I think, uh, and the matrix in memory for the subset, the sub matrix, uh, that's gonna take a little bit like I'm doing here, the showing that you can cast the, the say that's on the disk for this H5 back uh, RSCs. You can cast it to a matrix which means uh, just a plain matrix memory that's gonna actually read all the slices that you, you, you all the samples versus uh, maybe features if you had all that slide, that, that uh, subset is gonna be uh, read from the disk at that point and it's gonna take a while. I noticed that it can take quite a bit if it's a large, despite the indexing is not as fast as I uh, like to be sometimes, but it's still, uh, much better solution than having to deal with loading that whole huge file in memory <laughs> if it wasn't compressed in any way at least. Yeah, you can also com convert it from file, uh, this also takes a little bit, uh, convert it from uh, HDF5 being directly, so you download, uh, if it's a large subset of samples in junction data, especially you can directly load it compressed into a sparse matrix. Now, another challenge that we had with this uh, is when we build this large merged uh, RSCs across all the data sets that we had, and uh, which was, was okay and kind of it's obvious how it should be done or RSC uh, for genes and uh, exons and, and transcripts because those features are fixed. So basically we have the same rows, uh, row data and row ranges. Uh, but when it comes to junctions, we have this uh, problem that we have to, we cannot use something like CBind to merge multiple data sets. We have to find a way to get the common set of, you know, the union of all the junctions, junction features, right? And uh, this merge process can be quite uh, intensive, especially when you don't use compression in any, at any point. Uh, it, it's easy to run out of memory because just a merge operation itself can, of course, uh, uh, needs more memory, more than uh, double, right, uh, than the original data. So, well, we know what we have to do, and there are also solutions uh, to that. And uh, I think, yeah, the first attempt that uh, I saw in the the scripts were using some uh, interesting way to, to build directly from the, from using reshape to melt uh, method to create this unwrapped uh, sparse matrix structure um, and uh, basically build the compressed merged, uh, directly the compressed merged matrix. But um, this, uh, this, it was quite uh, complex because the way, at least uh, the way implementation that I saw, it still didn't do, um, it still had to bear, a burden, bear the load of, of having this uh, 
comp uncompressed matrices loaded first, because that's how they are in the file. And the process was quite slow and still used quite a bit of memory. But and so I, I found another way to, to, to do it, but you just plain R um, and using, uh, it would give me a speed up, but it wasn't still, it wasn't ideal, right? You still have to, essentially I was doing the same thing that I saw in the script that was there, slightly optimized because I'm conversing, uh, converting the matrices and they directly to a DGC matrix a data structure and then merging the structures um, with CBind. Uh, it, it works well, but still uh, took quite a bit and still used, well, the memory user was not that bad, but what I found soon after that was that actually there is already, uh, there are ways to do this, but they are not very popular, I suppose, or I don't know how come we never run into this and they were recently added. Well, this is the code for the, for my attempt, but I guess there's no need to, you can find it in the, uh, in the, um, in the GitHub repository there as an example, but uh, yeah, it was a way to, to merge these uh, sparse matrices by directly using the, the X, uh, how is that called, slot, yeah, internal slot of the data structure. Uh, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's not very complicated, but it's just, it took some effort to, to put together and, and, and test, and it's not very, it would be nice, of course, if we can have this directly built in by a conductor, right? And actually the other surprise was that it is there, but it's somehow, somehow I don't know how I ran into it by mistake, uh, that it's actually there. Maybe in 2021, they added it, it seems to me, and it was somehow ported from single cell experiment, I think, again, uh, because of uh, Aaron, Aaron Lan works, uh, runs, oh, he, he did this back porting, I think, uh, from single cell experiment to, to this, uh, to, to summarize the experiment. Uh, even though the, I'm not sure exactly what this rectangular data concept was put in, it seems like it was put there from the beginning, uh, because it seems like a core concept. It's an abstract class that's in S4 vectors, which is always the foundation of, uh, as for classes in bioconductors. Um, and uh, it actually, it's an abstraction of these 2D rectangular um, matrices that we use for these measurements. But it also applies to any kind of tables like data frames even. Um, and uh, of course the assay data, that was the thing that we, uh, we have to do here because of course for summarized experiment in order to merge two junction uh, classes, the uh, object, to RS, uh, RSCs, we have to, uh, of course, uh, not only merge the matrix data, but also the raw data, right, has to be, which they go together usually because you first, you, the first move is still to get the union of the, of the sets that are the feature, features in each, in each uh, RSC. So I found that there were these abstract methods already in rectangular data, uh, class, which is a base abstract class that many other bioconductor classes and especially summarized experiment uh, and the related data are based on. So you have actually the option to combine rows. You see this uh, again with methods. I mean, method names are obvious. You, it's not like, a, it's like a merge, but it's you combine in a more flexible way than bind and C bind or R bind. So the methods are there, of course, rectangular, uh, data, I think it's only the, the abstract, so they're not really implemented, but um, the derived classes, including summarized experiment, actually uh, implemented these classes, I found out, maybe uh, methods, in, uh, maybe sometimes in 2021, and um, they are exactly what we are looking for in, in when we merge feature uh, junction RSCs, especially the combined calls, uh, and it's, yeah, it's remarkable that this kind of flexibility was there all the time. It's not a straightforward one actually to use. I found, I got some strange errors the first time I used it. Um, and I still is, I still have problems doing, using it for merging our easy uh, RSCs, which are the gene ones or the exons. I still get some weird errors sometimes, 
but those are easy to solve because I can use uh, essentially uh, CBind for that. Uh, but for Junction, this saved me a lot of uh, time. So just loading to RSC, uh, RSC Junction RSCs and then immediately converting them as you load them one by one, it's good to convert them to save uh, into DGC matrix format so you save uh, memory. And then you can actually, uh, after a bit of slightly a bit pre-processing, you have to unify the call data, uh, which you, we know we have to be done, usually use RSEG uh, call data. So that's not a problem, but also there was a weird um, error that I got into and I couldn't move past it at the first time I tried to use it, which was actually, um, is related to some of the character list uh, columns that we have in row data, which was like the list of transcripts for each junction. I think Andrew, uh, whoever wrote the code for, for created the row data, a lot of useful information in there. And some of them are actually a character list of uh, either genes involved in a, in a junction, if it's a, it's a chimeric junction, or even uh, yeah, some multiple trans transcripts that were uh, related to at least one end of the junction. So, uh, or each end of the junction. So yeah, we have this character list and apparently I had to submit, a, a, I tra trace it to the S4 vectors uh, class, actually a method in S4 vectors. And I submitted this uh, GitHub issue. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, I was, it was great that uh, the Page actually responded to that. and even uh, explain to me what the problem is, that there is indeed, uh, these methods don't seem to work with the, when character lists are in a data frame. It has, has a strange way to, of dealing with these uh, character list uh, classes. I mean, it cannot deal at this point. So uh, even the solution that I found was really silly. I basically, I convert those character lists when I do this uh, cast to data frame and and then a data you know, dot frame, and then back to data frame. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to, without the dot, the data frame with D and F, you know, see the different class that's in S4 vectors. Um, this cast back and forth actually converts the character lists in, in simple lists, I think, it's just plain lists. So, and the, those uh, list uh, columns are okay, uh, as opposed to character list columns for uh, reasons that Elve tried to uh, explain to me, but yeah, I couldn't tell. I mean, he knows the inner innards of, of this uh, S4 vectors class is much better. So uh, I understand there's a justification for it, but yeah, I'm just uh, trying to get around it. So that's the way I do it right now. Just cast data, data dot frame and then back to data frame. And then you can actually just call this combined calls on the two RSC objects and they are and then voila, right? That's the, the magic actually happens. Instead of going through all those relatively complicated code to, to get all these, um, you know, get the union of, of features uh, and then uh, try to reconstruct that matrix. This is done internally. And, and it, it, the, the great thing about it is also that it supports any kind of other um, backend you might have for the, for the matrices there. So it even works with the H HDF5 array backed RSCs. And actually uh, the combined calls method, I think even has a parameter that says uh, to use delayed, delayed array framework behind it or not, because they also assume there is some decompression going on. Uh, or if, you know, when you want to merge, you have to usually merge by blocks, but when you merge two matrices like that, but still that can take some memory. So in order to minimize, they have this uh, option to, when you call combined calls to use a uh, delayed array framework during the merge. So you can even, you can use RL, RLE array, which is in memory compression, but it's not, uh, it's, well, it doesn't really make much sense in this case, uh, if for very large data, because it still is not enough compression, but you can, uh, also use directly HDF5 array back. Uh, I think by default it uses that, especially if the source RSCs are also HDF5 array backed RSCs. So um, 
it still takes a long time because the process, especially, I mean, the combined calls call doesn't take, but it's delayed. The actual arrays, matrix is, is everything is, the indexing, everything is prepared. But when you actually save, want to save the merge object, uh, if you have HDF5 array uh, vector SEs, then at that, that time, the processing is done to actually fetch the, uh, uh, the actual matrix values, of course, and write to write them into a different uh, backend, either in memory, as if you want to decompress them, which probably don't, if you want to merge, or directly on another HDF5 array back to RSE on disk. Uh, I think, yeah, that's that's pretty much uh, covers what I wanted to show that we can use these methods and file formats in the future. Yeah, I guess that's what if you want, if you have any questions. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, thanks for going through this. I had run into all these issues before with the junctions, uh, but I, I ended up just going away from doing like a meta analysis. It, it's it's a thing, but so my my question really is: Do you think that on that it should be like a we should be doing saving them as um, these kind of HDF five formats at least for junctions or something like that so that we can use them because like if you have to like switch it in memory you've already loaded it into memory so it's like sometimes it's not useful to then switch it yourself yeah i'm definitely in favor of especially for junctions which are uh... Which are a pain to build it. I mean, I don't know. It was also discussion. Do we need to build all this uh, merged? Uh, this is an important use case to consider. Have this merging across data sets of of, uh, of um, these features, including junction level. That was the last one. That was hard to add, right? Um, because it's of these complex issues. But how often do you read all of it? I mean, sometimes it's most of analysis. Most of these analysis going only within a data set. It's not even advised to mix uh, across data sets. So you might not even need, uh, I definitely suggest to serve, uh, to at least use sparse, um, sparse matrix. Uh, you save the RSCs as sparse, you know, compressed. But uh, for counts, especially for RPKM, normalized might not be that good. But, but for H5, the, uh, the only problem is, yeah, it's everything is gonna be much slower. But again, do you do you need the whole the whole uh, data set at once? All these merged across data sets. That I'm saying, I'm, I'm curious about how often do you need everything, even the merge itself. Is it needed? Uh, well, I, I guess it's gonna be a case by case. I think it's not a great idea to. I think there's some caveats to trying to analyze all the different data sets at once. So it's probably like if we did have the merge, you then need, it would be probably a good idea to have it separately so that novice don't think that they should be doing that. It's more of like a novice like protection, but I, I think it's more to do with like storage and stuff. Like because theoretically you can filter the data set. Uh, and just you have one thing, especially since you look like it could be quite fast with if it was the HDF5, you could just filter out and get the one you want for each one and you don't even have to load it into memory. So. Right, yeah, no, you're right. There are no actually down. I would recommend this actually, yes, from uh, to say, especially junction data, even just for one data set at a time, it's still, I think it's much better to use this HDF format because indeed after that you're gonna do some filtering anyway, uh, even before you actually load the values, even based on you know uh, demographics or something. And actually, I I use that HDF5 array backend uh, in in the database uh, portal uh, data portal that uh, that I found uh, I I'm working on because I realized it's even faster. I did some benchmarks and. 
realized that it's actually faster to, to fetch, to slice the data from HDF5 arrays like that than the database. I, but that's only because a uh, database, like a uh, regular database, uh, like Postgres, like the way I'm using that RPPMS, um, it's not, doesn't provide good support for matrix, matrices, you know, the array data. Uh, so I have to do some tricks there and still fetch some rows in a special way. And of course the database side of it using SQL, it, it can be, it, it cannot really compete with this uh, optimized uh, array storage formats like HDF5. If they are indexed properly, my, 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 I, I, I was able to actually fetch from HDF5 like that from RSCs faster than the database, which is surprising, but that's how it works. Yeah, it's, from array, for array data, for matrix data, I couldn't find a better solution than this. Uh, I'm looking in TileDB. I'm hoping there are other formats out there and maybe Parquet at some point. I couldn't figure out if uh, indexing the indexing scheme in Parquet, if you can easily slice by rows and columns. Uh, yeah, that was going to be my next question if Parquet files existed in R. I know they're, they're pretty common in Python, but I haven't seen them in R. Yeah, you can write and read them. They have uh, the arrow, there is an arrow package, I think, or something. So, yeah. Yeah. Right, but so it, which is good for interoperability, but I didn't see, I, mean, I, would, I would like to see here a delayed array framework, you know, backend written for Parquet if it's possible. So, uh, and right now it's not there yet. I don't feel like writing it myself, but because I didn't write a lot in, uh, in uh, yeah, that, that would be interesting. I'm hoping that it'll. I saw some attempts to do like tile DD, which is, it seems to me it's similar attempt to use some sort of columnar or maybe a, just a generic array storage, optimized array storage. Um, and there is an attempt to write delay array backend for that. So I'm hoping, yeah, let's do this for Parquet. <laughs> it would be great. Thanks. Yeah, this was really useful, uh, especially it like touched on something that I was like a particular problem I was having as well. Like I think this last thing where you're able to merge RSCs, like um, in, in theory, like you could have all the rows be like disjoint, right? Like, or I mean, I know with junctions, you'd have like most of them shared, I guess, or a lot of them shared, but wouldn't this still work if you had like no shared rows <laughs> or am I misunderstanding? Right, yeah, it looks like it will. It will just add zeros for all the others. You know, for each data set, we'll have zero everywhere, right? For the other, for the disjoint uh, rows, yeah, which is kind of. Yeah, it's just like with the DNA methylation stuff, like a big problem I was having is like, I was able to use a lot of the HDF5 stuff for like keeping memory under control, but then there was a step where I would want to like merge up, merge across chromosomes and that was just like putting everything into memory and it was using ridiculous amounts. So like if this works, that would be fantastic for... Um, I would hope yeah. that there is, uh, I mean, I'm afraid it's a specialized code for that. Uh, I don't see, I don't know, I'm not familiar with DNA methylation. Do they have really the same RSC uh, structures? Um, yeah, so they, I mean, the one I use is like BS seq, which ex like extends some RS experiment um, and does have built in like support for HDF5, like backed uh, assays. Uh, um, yeah, that would be great if they support this since they have it inherited from the base class, right? Maybe yeah. implement it properly to work on this uh, end, uh, high end classes. That would mm -hmm. be yeah, I'll definitely have to try that. Okay, thank you. Then uh, I guess.